This week, we're taking issue with the chaos in the House Republican Caucus. Kevin McCarthy led a bipartisan effort to keep the government open and got kicked to the congressional curb for it. Plus, tax relief is on its way to Massachusetts, and so are more migrants. I'm Corey. I'm Matt. And I'm Sue. And this is Taking Issue. Our nation was born here, not with a whimper, but with the spark of revolution. One more indictment, and this election is closed out. That's what democracy is. It's a choice of the people, by the people, and for the people. Hello and welcome to the first, the inaugural, the big, beautiful debut of Taking Issue. We are the proverbial new kids on the podcast block, so we are so happy that you have joined us. My name is Corey Smith, and as you can see, I am one third of your trio of hosts. To my left is NBC 10 Boston political commentator and analyst Sue O'Connell. Say hi, let them know you're not AI generated. I am not AI generated. This is actually <laughs> me speaking the word from my head. And NBC 10 Boston political uh, reporter Matt Pritchard is here as well. Let the yes, people indeed. Know. Yes, actual here person <laughs> here, ready to provide context to anything and everything. Exactly. So what is this all about? Well, as you know, or as I hope you know, you can usually see all three of us on At Issue every Sunday morning on NBC 10 Boston at 1130. We cover politics and government from Beacon Hill to Capitol Hill and everywhere in between. But believe me when I tell you, there is always more to talk about. And that is what Taking Issue is going to be about. We're going to peel back the curtain, peel the onion, give you some background insight on the conversations that we have around our desks every single day because we sit about five feet from each other in the newsroom. In the and political pod. Yes. As like political to call pod, it the political as pod. we like to say. So with that, let's party, right? Uh, let's start with the local issue. Max tax relief, finally here. It just took two decades. That's not, <laughs> not that long. Uh, Matt, I know you were at the signing uh, mm -hmm. with Governor Maura Healey. What kind of sense did you get from her about whether she feels like this is a major accomplishment yeah. in her, her tenure as governor. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone seemed really optimistic about this. Governor Healy, of course, touting it as a major win for her administration, but also the speaker, as well as the Senate side of things, just thrilled with putting this forward, a billion dollars for Massachusetts families. As you mentioned, this took 20 years to put together. And while there are other steps to take, as always uh, there are with these sort of big uh, pieces of legislation, they really feel like they uh, have a win here. Do you think this was getting done in your lifetime? Yeah, I mean, eventually, you think that in a state like Massachusetts, where everyone seems to be a Democrat, they would be able to have agreed on <laughs> this a lot sooner. <laughs> sure. Uh, and the arguments that they have is often like what big families have arguments about. Not everybody gets what they want. But I think that this, this was the moment that folks have been waiting for, where everybody was collectively working on it. Obviously, the timeline of when it happens and, you know, the deadlines passing is always very frustrating. Uh, but I think overall, uh, folks are happy that it happened. And yes, I did expect at some point to see it. So we knew the House and the Senate and the governor all wanted different things. Mm -hmm. The governor, for her part, wanted 5% short-term capital gains tax rate, the state tax threshold to $3 million, up from $1 million. Business leaders wanted $5 million. And that child independent tax credit, which is so important right now, given the cost of pretty much everything from food to child care to $600. What she got, a lot of folks are saying is kind of meet in the middle. 8.5% short-term capital gains tax rate. That is state threat tax threshold, $2 million, and $440 per year in the child dependent tax credit. I know you guys spoke to Senate President Karen Spilka. Right. She called this a, a historic effort. Let's play some sound. I want to get y'all's reaction on the other side. It's really historic. It's wide ranging. It is the largest uh, bipartisan legislative tax mm -hmm. relief bill in over a generation, many decades. Uh, and there are so many pieces to make Massachusetts more affordable, more competitive, more equitable, and especially targeting working families, giving relief for working families. I right, see. So what did you make of Karen Spilka calling this, you know, historic generational tax yeah, relief? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, you know, Massachusetts always has this reputation of being tax Massachusetts, we've got the millionaire tax issue, uh, we have folks who want the tax money to go somewhere else, they want higher taxes on certain people, lower taxes on others, but this actually is a victory, and, and sort of to my illusion earlier, you don't get everything you want in the budget process, and our job is often to look at these 
uh, results and pick apart what folks didn't get, but I think in the end it's a major victory for, for people who worked on it and probably for the citizens. She right to be taking kind of a victory lap? Yeah. You know, she got the zone with Rob Mariano? Well, she certainly thinks so. I mean, we talked with her on that issue about the fact of whether this goes far enough when it comes to working families in Massachusetts. I mean, there's a couple of things in, in there that we mentioned, the estate tax as well as a few other pieces that are really business-centered. And Does that really benefit the common man here in Massachusetts? She certainly thinks so, and I think you see that with the child tax care credits, uh, those sort of steps, trying to put, put up more housing uh, here in Massachusetts, another big problem that we're all facing. And so anyways, I, I think she has a right to be excited about where they landed here, but whether they have more work to be done is what we'll have to see if the state legislature there, has time for. There's always got to be winners and losers when you do any piece of legislation. And some of the social media or the reaction that we saw was this is just basically the governor and the state and house giving back after they you know pass the millionaires tax is that is that a fair criticism is this just a way around that and making the the richer folks in massachusetts a little bit more happy with with uh, governor healing yeah I, I would definitely say i mean remember even though we're in a liberal progressive state more healy is a lot like charlie baker yeah. <laughs> that's how she was <laughs> able to get elected uh and we have a somewhat um, compared to what we would expect in Massachusetts, a somewhat moderate uh, lawmakers on Beacon Hill. The way to kind of blunt the impact of the millionaire's tax, which everyone is saying anytime anyone moves out of Boston or Massachusetts, people are like, well, it's the millionaire's right. tax, that's why they're moving out. And now there's something else here on the, on the buffet, if you will, that people could say, well, you get this instead. So I don't think it's a go around, but I do think it's a bit of a blunt. We knew as this was being debated that there was always this push and pull. And I remember having uh, some reporters on, on that issue and asking them, who is this tax relief for? Is this for the folks who are already here or is it for the businesses that they want to attract? And to that point, the rental deduction cap to $4,000 up from $3,000 in earned income tax credit up to 40% from the federal rate of 30%. How do you, how do you score this? Did, did, did the common man win here? Because I mean, you look at WBUR, they sent a newsletter out talking about what you're gonna save under this tax relief plan, a renter, 50 bucks. Right. A parent, at least $200 per kid. A senior with high housing costs, $1,200. If you have a $2 million plus estate, about 99 grand. I mean, it's, but like you said, winners and losers, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and every dollar helps, I think, for a lot of people sure. that are struggling down in that lower echelon of Massachusetts residents. I mean, speaking with advocates on both the housing and the child care side, they're just thrilled to have anything right. being done here because they felt like for a long time, Massachusetts uh, wasn't taking steps to make the people that they represent uh, whole in this state. And so, you know, one step in the right direction, whether there's more steps to take, we'll have to see. You know, when, when, you're, at, when you're at the top 10% or 20% of earners and you look down the, the ladder and you think, well, that's not that big an impact for someone at the, the, the lower economic rungs, but it is, actually. It is a big impact, especially if you're an elderly person who's paying higher taxes because your home value has gone up. And to the renters, you know, the housing stock, what it is, we're going to end up having more renters here in Massachusetts than every year. I think that number is going to grow, and we want to attract the people who have gone to school here. Mm -hmm. The 250,000 or so people that come here every fall and graduate, we want them to stay here. So it's not just the progressives that are saying, yay, boo, I guess is yeah. the best way to put it. Uh, got some thoughts from the business community. We had Doug Howgate, president of the Max Tax Foundation. He says the package is paid for, affordable, and overdue. Happy negotiators included just about every element in both the House and Senate proposals, even if some were scaled back. Jim Rooney, who we know, CEO of Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, he said this agreement marks a pivotal day for the state, even if the business community didn't get everything. The Mass Fiscal Alliance, though, not too happy. They said tax, this tax relief package includes major tax hikes, laughable to think it would address any sort of competitive disadvantage Massachusetts has economically. The good does not outweigh the bad. I remember when we spoke with Governor Sununu, he said, what, what is it saying? New Hampshire is just the tax-free suburb right. of Boston. Right. It's not going to impact any sort of competition there is to attract businesses. Is there enough for businesses in this package to say, maybe take a look at Massachusetts. No, I, I think so, but I also think it's important to contrast this to what our Republican governors in the past have done when they give you a tax break and then they give you a fee. 
right? Yeah. So yeah. you get a break on this, and then you got to go to the registry, and this costs you, or you got to file this, and that costs you, and they eat up all the little things, all the savings you might get from your tax breaks through fees. So I think it's always just a way of how you how you slice it. But yes, it's going to be competitive. I mean, it, it, the, New Hampshire has. Uh, a, a lot to offer to somebody who isn't concerned about supporting the rest of the people who live in New Hampshire. Sure. Matt, I want to ask you, for, for somebody who's going to be obviously following what comes next and, and as we see this, this tax relief implemented, from the reporter standpoint, what, what sort of stories are, are you looking at? What areas are you looking at to see whether or not this is actually making a difference? Yeah, I mean, that's the next step is seeing how it's implemented. In fact, I asked Governor Healy at the end of her press conference just how do you go about educating people about how to take advantage of everything that you've put out here. So I think first off is just seeing if we are building up more housing for people on that affordable scale. Where are we doing it? How are we doing it? And making Boston more accessible uh, for everyone across the landscape. You know, does that child care tax credit really make a dent for people. I think you can talk with parents in those lower income echelons. I think that's an important story to tell as we go along here. And then the business community seeing if we are attracting, you know, those big names to come to Massachusetts and decide to put down roots here. I mean, you know, I think Lego is coming in, yeah, right? Lego, There's a yeah. massive uh, headquarters going in downtown. Are we seeing that sort of investment starting to come into the Commonwealth? We'll just have to wait and see. Uh, let's go back to, to Karen Spickle. When you guys talked to her, you spoke about the migrant crisis. Mm -hmm here in Massachusetts. She says what a lot of states are saying. We want to help, but we need help. This problem is on more, more people are going to come. We know that we're seeing that in, in places like New York. This is no longer a southern border problem. Um, if the state doesn't get help from the federal government and not just money, but an actual comprehensive immigration reform, does this problem get exponentially worse? Yeah, I, I mean, this is this problem is not going to get better. I, I mean, to your point, people are going to keep coming. This has been a decades-long problem that Congress has failed to take action under, uh, whether it's democratically controlled or republic. Everybody has blame in this situation with our migration, our immigration, our path to citizenship, our DACA kids, our permits to work. No matter how you slice it, this is a federal problem. And we have, as Texas and the southern border has pointed out, been living in this bubble where we haven't had to deal with the problem because it's been a theoretical, right? Mm -hmm. We've, we talk about it, but we haven't had people here on our doorsteps, and now we do. And I think, as we're seeing in New York, and I imagine we're going to see more of it from Governor Healy, putting the pressure on Biden and the Biden administration to figure out how they're going to get funding, how they're going to get support, and hopefully Congress will take action to make something work. I don't know what the answer right. is, but I'm not elected. Well, and let me just say too, I mean, at that signing today for the tax relief, immediately this whole topic switched over to the migrant crisis, which just shows you that it's sucking all the oxygen out of the room. And you can tell that our leaders here in Massachusetts are just exasperated by the crisis. I mean, Speaker Mariano spoke afterwards and you can just hear the frustration in his voice. Uh, I think Senate President Spilka also said similar things. Uh, and then Governor Maura Healey. I mean, you can just feel that they're all waiting for the federal government to take a step here and help Massachusetts. They just don't know when it's coming. Plus, we have this fertile area of jobs right. for these migrants right. who have come, especially in the healthcare industry, and as well as in some of the working farms that we have in the state, some of the manufacturing that we have. Uh, almost everywhere you go, people are looking for help, and this would be a great way to solve it if they could get the, the, the certificates they need to get to work, which is a federal problem. You also spoke to Superintendent Mary Skipper um, after you spoke with Karen Spilka, and the number that surprised me, I know it surprised you because yeah, I heard you literally say, wow, yeah. Yeah. BPS has enrolled more than 1,300 recently arrived migrants since July 1st. That, that number is a little bit shocking, but the, the, the other part that really stood out to me is that a good portion of these unaccompanied minors yeah. are older yeah. students. She, she even mentioned some kids who were just, who are, who are already 18, yeah, I'm um, not but, sure but need to be yeah, these, they, taught English and things like that. Yeah, they, they, they I, I'm not sure what the ceiling number is for um, attendance in mm. Massachusetts or Boston public schools. I think it might be 20 or 21. Okay. So they're legally able to come to school. Um, and it's not just the, the older kids who are unaccompanied adults. I'm hearing reports of kids just being dropped off at preschools and kindergartens. Mm. Um, and they're not even sure what language that they're speaking. So um, the good news about uh, the major school systems like the Boston Public School Systems and the other large urban areas is that they do have elements in place to already take care of 
kids and young adults and older teens who come in like this. Those so because of the nature of the students that are already in the school system. So, but that number is going to also just continue to grow. And Corey, you mentioned the language thing. I mean, that's right. huge for the schools. The fact that you know these kids show up, they don't speak the language English, mm -hmm. and a lot of teachers don't speak Spanish. And, and a lot so, of it isn't Spanish, which is yeah. the other part right. of a lot of oh, yeah. indigenous uh, languages. Haitian Creole yep. stuff like yep. that. Yeah. It's going to be a problem for the next several years, that is for sure. But, but to your point, this is a problem that Congress has continually yep. kicked down the road. Uh, but Congress also has another very big problem on its hand. History happened. Kevin McCarthy is Speaker no more. For the first time, a Speaker of the House was voted out in a motion to vacate, brought by Matt Gates, who is not a friend of Kevin McCarthy, as we learned back in January when it took 15 times for Kevin McCarthy to become Speaker. Anyway, uh, McCarthy, as you know, struck the deal with a bi bipartisan report, mainly Democrats, to keep the government open and avert a shutdown, and that was basically the last straw. Matt Gates brings this motion to vacate to the floor. Uh, it, it passes with bipartisan support again. Sure. 216 to 210, eight Republicans vote to oust Kevin McCarthy. He says he is not going to run for speaker. Is anybody surprised that we have arrived at this point? No, I mean, I think the clock started ticking in January when it took 15 times to get him into the speaker's role in the first place. I mean, we knew that eventually this motion was going to come from that flank of the party, and it finally did. I mean, they just got tired of the compromises, I guess, that Kevin McCarthy was willing to take. And simultaneously, it appears Kevin McCarthy made a lot of people angry on both sides of the aisle, and that's why he finds himself in the situation he's in. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it was striking to me immediately after the Democrats saved the day on funding the short-term funding gap to keep the government open uh, and save Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he then goes out on Monday and demeans and criticizes the Democrats. And to me, that was a moment where, well, you know, I keep trying to find which movie it is. You know, when two enemies join together to fight the aliens and the apocalyptics or whoever's, mm. whatever winter is coming, and then you're victorious, and then your enemy falls off a cliff and is holding up their hand for you to catch them, and you just kind of look at them like, yeah. well, if I save sure you... i season of Game of Thrones. So. Right, that's you're going right, to come yeah. back and kill me, <laughs> yeah. so why would I save you? And I think that's, you know, Kevin McCarthy made no friends. I mean, I think that if I had, I'm going to keep with my little analogies here, if I had a gun and said, here, I'm going to give this to you, and if I lie to you, you can shoot me, yeah. I would be making friends with you. I'd be making friends with the Democrats and trying to build the, you know, the coalition of the problem solvers and the moderate Democrats so that when this attack came, I'd have 219 votes. He left, in my opinion, he left himself no wiggle room. Like a lot of Republicans who on January 6th blasted former President Trump for, for what they saw as his role uh, in the riot. And then he went to Mar-a-Lago right. and took a photo with him, was back, was back in his good graces, as Trump calls him, Mike Kevin. Right. Um, but you saw after the vote, Republican pundits come on and say, the Democrats made a big mistake here. If they want any sort of hope of, of continuing funding Ukraine and some of their priorities, they should have done whatever they had to do to save Kevin McCarthy's skin. And you can run through the laundry list of ways that Kevin McCarthy has sort of kicked Democrats in the butt from yeah. the Eric Swalwell and, and the, the censure uh, of Adam Schiff the um, to the impeachment to, to providing cover to some of the House members uh, who were who were far, far more out there uh, calling for, you know, action, I guess, following the 2020 election. And I was watching this. I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, have have these folks been paying attention? And, and this all, as we know, with everything in Congress comes down to math, and the phrase that you kept hearing again and again and again is, not my monkey, not my circus. Can right. you can you blame Democrats for, yeah, look, the, the Ukraine aid is, is up in the air at this point, but can you really blame them for saying, we're not gonna help the guy who's basically shown us the middle finger a few times? Yeah, well, I mean, in the old saying, right, if your opponents are shooting at each other, don't stand in the middle. I mean, and essentially, that's what Democrats are doing here. And in Washington, everything's always looking forward to the next election. So, I mean, you see this much dysfunction within a party, and truthfully, I think at this point we can say safely, an inability to govern the House of Representatives. You're looking ahead to 2024 and saying to voters, hey, look, they can't do the job. Clearly, we can. And so put us back in the majority so that we can get back to the business of the people. And the Ukraine funding wasn't going to happen with McCarthy there. I mean, no. that's like, that's if, like. If you, if you trusted him to think that exactly. he was going to bring it to the floor. So, so the Democrats weren't getting anything anyway in this Congress 
uh, they might have if you didn't have the the um, the, the Freedom Caucus mm -hmm. blocking things. But you've got the Republicans fighting themselves. No lawmaking is getting done. So the Democrats haven't really had any success. Mm -hmm. The only success they've had is when they've had to jump in and save mm -hmm. McCarthy. So there's there's no there there. So the Democrats can just say, knock yourselves out. We'll see you around next election. So immediately after this vote occurs, you had correspondence going down to California to, to, to ask voters in McCarthy's district what they think. And, and a lot of them were applauding him for, for keeping the government open. Yep. A lot of them were saying that perhaps this vote shows that the Trump wing of the Republican Party is not governable and things will change. I'm not buying that because as much as they want to talk about Kevin McCarthy being this great fundraiser in congressional races, we know who butters their bread and it's Donald Trump. And I don't think, at least in the short term, that they're ever going to turn away. So I guess his ouster, is this better for Ma the MAGA crowd or folks who want just government to, 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 to fund? I, I, I would disagree a bit. I actually think um, that it was um, it was a loss for Donald Trump with McCarthy getting taken down. And I think it was also a loss for Donald Trump that um, the only Republicans who voted to, to oust McGovern, um, McCarthy, I'm sorry, were the, um, the, the, the Freedom Caucus. And I also think that it gives a really stark contrast to voters between the Democrats and the Republicans. Like, of all the criticism that Democrats have had for decades about how they don't follow orders, they don't lockstep, they're not in agreement, you just need to look at what a great job Hakeem Jeffries did keeping everybody in order. I know this is a little inside baseball for regular voters, but then look at Nancy Pelosi and the career that she had moderating a variety of socialists and, you know, blue dog Democrats all across the spectrum who did what they were supposed to do for the good of the party and the president's agenda or to block the president's agenda. And now the Republicans just look like they don't know what they're doing. So if you're Joe Biden, you just, again, stay out of the way. To the point, you're on the campaign trail. How do you think this bleeds into the presidential race on the on the GOP side. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think every candidate is going to take a different approach to it. I mean, you know, Vivek Ramaswamy today is already sort of going into the the outlandish idea of having Donald Trump as the Speaker of the House and sort of going into that side of things. But then you have the Nikki Haley's and the Tim Scott's of the world who are probably going to say, look, this is why we need Republican leadership that's a little bit more, you know, in the middle or at least on the mainstream conservative that you would have thought about 20 plus years ago. So. That's the interesting thing about the Republican field right now is you have the two wings you were talking about, Corey, is both of them waging war and trying to take over and, sh and move the Republican Party into the next generation. All right. So as for what comes next, we already have some names in the ring. Uh, Jim Jordan and Steve Scalise have both said that they will run for speaker. Uh, Tom Emmer, who's right now the House Majority Whip, says he wants to become the majority leader, which uh, Scalise already holds. Uh, and Guy Rinsenthaler wants to be the majority whip. Elise Stefanik has also thrown her name in there I a little bit. I think she's pulled out. I think yeah, she's, she's pulled just, out. Just okay. a few minutes okay. ago as we're taping this, okay. she said that she's um, not interested. In the timeline, they're going to hold a candidate forum on Tuesday of next week. They're going to hold a leadership election on Wednesday. As we sit here, who is going to be the next Speaker of the House? I, I guess of that list, I would have to say Scalise. I think I think he actually brings the most experience. I think he has a foot in every camp, um, and uh, I, I I I think he'll get the most. And I use the term moderate moderate Republican votes uh, of them all. I think it's interesting. I do think the two names that have risen are kind of the two candidates that you would have thought you know would be the next runners up. But I, I'll go the other one with Jim Jordan. I think he's uh, somebody who both wings of the party might be interested in, you know, and might throw a vote his way because, you know, the MAGA folks may feel that he has their best interests in mind. But Jim Jordan, at times, you think back to when McCarthy was going through those 15 rounds, he was in McCarthy's corner and saying, no, we have to put Kevin McCarthy in the speaker's chair, which shows an ability, I think, to look at the other perspective. But I guess what makes either of those two different than Kevin McCarthy. They both have been serving with him for a long time. Obviously, I would, I would assume they're not going to agree to this one person to, to get a motion to vacate up there. But if I'm one of the, what I heard one reporter call the recalcitrant eight who voted to oust Kevin McCarthy, why would I vote for somebody who is who has supported him in the past? I, I don't think they are going to vote. I, I mean, I don't think they're going to vote for either one of them in, yeah. in one way. But I think that both of them are better leaders than McCarthy was. I think that they both had um, more experience in um, chairing committees 
and doing outreach. I think both of them what, were also. What was, what was his downfall? Was he just? He's a liar. Just, oh, okay. He's a, I mean, he, you can't promise everybody every single thing. I mean, I don't know that he's lying as much mm. as wish casting, yeah. you know. And I, he has such a desire to be liked by everybody. And when you do that, you inevitably be liked by no one. Very and Trump that's what yeah. happened. Okay. Yeah, and that's, and that's yeah, very Trumpy, but it's also hard to be, he's not as charismatic as yeah. Trump, right? Trump can sure. lie to you and people go, oh yeah, great, he's telling me the truth. But McCarthy just was not a leader in the way that you have to herd the, the cats, if you will, to get them to do what you want. And again, when he's telling one person, we're not going to bundle the votes, and then he bundles the votes, mm -hmm. and then that's one of seven quote-unquote lies or uh, deceptions that they feel, they're not going to trust him. Yeah. And if you, if you can't trust your leader, even if you disagree with him, you're not going to fall in line. But Jim, do you think Jim Jordan and Scalise are, have a little bit more credit right now with, with the caucus? Yeah, I mean, you know, Scalise has a, a strong history of just, right. you know, after getting shot, coming out and saying, you know, I'm a Second Amendment guy. You know, he's apologizing for having to wear a mask because of his cancer treatment. Yeah, which I learned, I realized he had blood cancer. Yeah, he's got blood cancer and he's, you know, he's still been going to work and um, is trying to explain why he's wearing a mask because he's right. been very anti-mask. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but that's the world the Republicans live in. They can manage that kind of hypocrisy, but they can't manage just being flatly told, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna do something and then do it. Well, at a time when the Senate is debating um, attire, on the floor, it'd be interesting if Jim Jordan becomes yeah. speaker. Is right. he finally going to put a jacket on? Yeah, no. it's been really hard. No, no he's not. I guess we'll have to see. Yeah. Hey, before we go, one more yes or no question that, that really impacts everybody. Regardless of who the next speaker is, are we going to have a government shutdown in 40 ish days? Well, I think it depends on who the speaker is. I mean, I, I, I would say um, probably because of the chaos that's going to ensue, I don't really think there's going to be a vote Tuesday and then it's going to be done. I think, you know, when, I, when we were leading up to this recent deadline, every lawmaker I spoke with said that we are 100% going to have a government shutdown, and then at the last moment they find a way to save themselves. So you can never say for certain, but the fact that we're going to have to go through this speaker nomination process and voting process, however long it takes, days are bleeding away. I mean, we are just about to go under 40 days till that next deadline. All right. Well, that is it for episode one of Taking Issue. We can't promise a historical <laughs> news event every single episode, That's but we right. do hope that you will join us uh, every week for this new podcast. For Sue, for Matt, I'm Corey. We'll talk to you later.